Good evening, friends, and welcome to Sleepy Tom Tales, a podcast aimed at helping you to get a good night's sleep. Do you find your mind plagued with the stresses of modern life, especially when the lights are out and you're trying to get a restful night? Does your spinning mind keep you awake? Follow my voice down the path towards a good night's rest. Listen to me tell a story that will keep your mind from wandering to your daytime problems. The ones you can't solve right now and will be easier to solve while rested. Listen to my voice and allow yourself to drift. Following the twists and turns of the story, but slowly letting go and drifting into sleep. Before we get on with the story, I've got some rather exciting news. Sleepy Tom Tales has a very fantastic and uh, very suitable new partnership. If you enjoy Sleepy Tom Tales or listening to music at night or even other podcasts, I don't hold it against you. You may sometimes struggle with headphones or uncomfortable earbuds. Or maybe you listen to whatever you are listening to out loud, but are concerned about bothering other people at night. Well, have I got the product for you? Sleep phones are designed for that express purpose. They use soft, flexible speakers fitted into a comfortable headband for maximum overnight comfort. Wired versions are available at very competitive prices, and wireless versions are also available for maximum convenience. So if you'd like to take your bedtime story experience to a whole new level, check out sleepphones.sleepytimetales.net or go to the link in the show notes to check out Sleep Phones, find something that suits you, and also support Sleepy Time Tales while you're at it. If you'd rather support the show more directly, then of course there's always the Patreon, which is the monthly support that helps me keep the lights on, and can get you fun bonuses based on your contribution level. Uh, the link to that also is in the show notes. And go and, even if you're curious and don't have the money right now, take a look and see what's available there. If monthly support's a big ask, you can just throw a tip in the tip jar at uh, paypal.me slash sleepytimetales. Uh, easily found through the website as well. And that's enough can rattling for tonight. I would just like to give a shout out to the music, which is Sweet Night and Friends Bakumiku. The music is available on their website at loyaltyfreakmusic.com. Thanks for checking the time. Let's get back to the show. So what exactly is Sleepy Time Tales? What is it for? What is this strange idea, this podcast that you're supposed to fall asleep to? But in the 21st century, lack of sleep is a health crisis, and this is a podcast intended to help those that it can to get a restful night. Do you find yourself lying awake at night, mind spinning and emotions in turmoil with anxieties of 21st century life? Do you wake up in the middle of the night and find yourself not quite able to doze back off for 3 a.m.? I'm here to help. My name is Dave, and I'm your narrator, here to help you into a restful night. Sleepy Time Tales is intended to be used as a distraction to what keeps you awake at night. Or maybe you'd rather have some kind of background noise or company. Because that's why I make the episodes quite long. So that I'm here for you, without any pressure of the end coming. Now as far as I know, there are a couple of different ways to engage with the show. The main idea is that it gives you something to focus on. A story or an event that lets you keep your mind on a specific point. To stop it from spinning out into stress and anxieties. To focus just enough not to resist the embrace of a night's sleep when it comes for you. But maybe you need something a bit different. Maybe you just need some kind of background noise. Some people like white noise, some people like the sound of the ocean, wind in the trees, the rain, or maybe some boring dude just droning on. But however you're engaging with the show, just the important thing is that you don't try to force the sleep. Just keep a light mental grip on the thread of the tail and let the need for sleep come for you. Now obviously I'm hoping that you're asleep before I get to the end of the episode, but it is important that you don't feel pressurized. This will probably not work on your first night, 
I recommend giving it a solid two, preferably three nights to try. See if you can get used to the strangeness of the whole idea. The sound of my voice, or my accent. And initially, maybe one episode isn't long enough. Or maybe your problem isn't so much going to sleep. Maybe your problem is waking up in the middle of the night. This is something that happens to me quite a lot, and my solution to it is the sleep podcast that I listen to, and I suggest you do this with Sleepy Time Tales, is you download a whole bunch of episodes at once and just hang on to them. Put them all in a playlist, and then when you go to bed at night, start with the latest and let them go. That way, if you wake up at 3am and you find yourself staring at the ceiling, you can just pop your earbuds back in or and allow yourself to go straight back to sleep again. Sometimes you might have even wake up a little bit before your alarm, 60 minutes or as little as 30 minutes. I do the same thing and I carry on listening and I go straight back to sleep again. And it may sound strange. What is the point of an extra 30 minutes of sleep in the context of a, of a whole night? But there is something about allowing yourself the perfect relaxation right before the alarm that's satisfying on a whole new deep level. It is very important though that you try to relax. If you're new to the show and prone to late nights of sleeplessness, this may seem strange to you, so give it a chance. Because I'm here to work with you, to create a safe space, a cocoon in which you can curl up and allow nature to take its course. So if you're still with me, thank you for staying. If you're already asleep, we'll chat again soon. And of course, you aren't hearing me, except maybe in a dream. we we'll return this week to astronomy, the science of the heavenly bodies, by David P. Todd. Kepler, the Great Calculator Most fortunate it was for the later development of astronomical theory that Tycho Brahe not only was a practical or observational astronomer of the highest order, but that he confined himself studiously for years to observations of the places of the planets. Of Mars he accumulated an especially long and accurate series, and among those who assisted him in his work was a young and brilliant pupil named Johann Kepler. Strongly impressed with the truth of the Copernican system, Kepler was free to reject the erroneous compromise system divided by Tycho, and soon after his death Kepler addressed himself seriously to the great problem that no one had ever attempted to solve. V. To find out what the laws of motion of the planets around the sun really are. Of course, he took the fullest advantage of all that Ptolemy and Copernicus had done before him, and he had in addition the splendid observations of Tycho Brahe as a basis to work upon. Copernicus, and while he had effected the tremendous advance of substituting the sun for the earth as the centre of motion, nevertheless clung to the erroneous notion of Ptolemy that all the bodies of the sky must perforce move at uniform speeds and in circular curves, the circle being the only perfect curve. Kepler was not long in finding out that this could not be so, and he found it out because Tycho Brahe's observations were much more accurate than any that Copernicus had employed. Naturally, he attempted the nearest planet first, and that was Mars, the planet that Tycho had assigned to him for research. How fortunate that the orbit of Mars was the one, of all the planets, to show practically the greatest divergence from the ancient conditions of uniform motion in a perfect circular orbit. Had the orbit of Mars chanced to be as nearly circular as is that of Venus, Kepler might well have been driven to abandon his search for the true curve of planetary motion. However, the facts of the cosmos were on his side, but the calculations essential in testing his various hypotheses were of the most tedious nature. B. 
because logarithms were not yet known in his day. His first discovery was that the orbit of Mars is certainly not a circle, but oval or elliptic in figure, and the sun he soon found could not be in the centre of the ellipse, so he made a series of trial calculations with the sun located in one of the foci of the ellipse instead. Then he found he could make his calculated places of Mars agree quite perfectly with Tycho Bray's observed positions, if only he gave up on the other ancient requisite of perfectly uniform motion. On doing this, it soon appeared that Mars, when in perihelion, or nearest the Sun, always moved swiftest, while at its greatest distance from the Sun, or aphelion, its orbital velocity was slowest. Kepler did not busy himself to inquire why these revolutionary discoveries of his were as they were. He simply went on making enough trials in Mars, and then on the other planets in turn, to satisfy himself that all the planetary orbits are elliptical, not circular in form, and are so located in space that the centre of the Sun is at one of the two foci of each orbit. This is known as Kepler's first law of planetary motion. The second one did not come quite so easy. It concerned the variable speed with which the planet moves at every point of the orbit. We must remember how handicapped he was in solving this problem. Only the geometry of Euclid to work with and none of the refinements of the higher mathematics of a later day but he finally found a very simple relation which represented the velocity of the planet everywhere in its orbit. It was this. If we calculate the area swept or passed over by the planet's radius vector, that is, the line joining its centre to the sun's centre, during a week's time near perihelion, and then calculate the similar area for a week near aphelion, or indeed for a week when Mars is in any intermediate parts of its orbit, we shall find that these areas all equal to each other. So Kepler formulated his second great law of planetary motion very simply. The radius vector of any planet describes, or sweeps over, equal areas in equal times. And he found this was true for all the planets. But the real genius of the great mathematician was shown in the discovery of his third law, which is more complex and even more significant than the other two. A law connecting the distances of the planets from the sun with their periods of revolution about the sun. This cost Kepler many additional years of close calculation, and the resulting law, his third law of planetary motion, is this. The cubes of the mean or average distances of the planets from the Sun are proportional to the squares of their times of revolution around him. So Kepler had not only disposed of the sacred theories of motion of the planets held by the ancients as inviolable, but he had demonstrated the truth of a great law which bound all the bodies of the solar system together. So accurately and completely did these three laws account for all the motions that the science of astronomy seemed as if finished, and no matter how far in the future a time might be assigned, Kepler's laws provided the means of calculating the planet's position for that epoch as accurately as it would be possible to observe it. Kepler paused here, and he died in 1630. Chapter 11 Galileo, the Great Experimenter The 15th and 16th centuries contained the lives and works of Copernicus, Tycho, Galileo, Kepler, Huygens, Halley and Newton, were a veritable golden age of astronomy. All these men were truly great and original investigators. None had a career more picturesque and popular than did Galileo. Born a few years earlier and dying a few years later than Kepler, the work of each of these two great astronomers was wholly independent of the other, 
and in entirely different fields. Kepler was discovering the laws of planetary motion, while Galileo was laying the secure foundations of the new science of dynamics, in particular the laws of falling bodies, that was necessary before Kepler's laws could be fully understood. When only eighteen, Galileo's keen power of observation led to his discovery of the laws of pendulum motion, suggested by the oscillation to and fro of a lamp in the Cathedral of Pisa. The world-famous Leaning Tower of this place, where he was born, served as a physical laboratory from the top of which he dropped various objects, and thus was led to formulate the laws of falling bodies. He proved that Aristotle was all wrong in saying that a heavy body must fall swifter in proportion to its weight than a lighter one. These and other discoveries rendered him unpopular with his associates, who christened him the Wrangler. The new system of Copernicus appealed to him, and when he, first of all men, turned a telescope on the heavenly bodies, there was Venus with phases like those of the moon, and Jupiter with satellites travelling about it. A Copernican system in miniature. Nothing could have happened that would have provided a better demonstration of the truth of the new system and the falsity of the old. His marvellous discoveries caused the greatest excitement, consternation even, among the anti copernicans Galileo published the Sidereus Nuncius, with many observations and drawings of the moon, which he showed to be a body not wholly dissimilar to the earth. This too was obviously of great moment in corroboration of the Copernican order, and in contradiction to the Ptolemaic, which maintained sharp lines of demarcation between things terrestrial and things celestial. His telescopes, small as they were, revealed to him anomalous appearances on both sides of the planet Saturn, which he called Anse, or Handles, but their subsequent disappearance was unaccountable to him and later observers, who kept on guessing ineffectively till Hagen's, nearly a half century after, showed that the true nature of the appendage was a ring. Spots on the sun were frequently observed by Galileo and led to bitter controversies. He proved, however, that there were objects on the sun itself, not outside it, and by noticing their repeated transits across the sun's disk, he showed that the sun turned around on his axis in a little less than a month. Another analogy to the like motion of the Earth on the Copernican plan. Galileo's appointment in 1610 as first philosopher and mathematician to the Grand Duke of Tuscany gave him abundant time for the pursuit of original investigations and the preparation of books and pamphlets. His first visit to Rome the year following was the occasion of a reception with great honour by many cardinals and others of high rank. His lack of sympathy with others whose views differed from his, and his naturally controversial spirit, had begun to lead him headlong into controversies with the Jesuits and the Church, which culminated in a censure by the authorities of the Church and persecution by the Inquisition. In 1618 three comets appeared, and Galileo was again in controversial hot water with the Jesuits. But it led to the publication, five years later, of Il Saggiatore, the Essaia, of no great scientific value, but only a brilliant bit of controversial literature, dedicated to the newly elevated Pope, Urban VIII. Later, he wrote, through several years, a great treatise, more or less controversial in character, entitled A Dialogue on the Two Chief Systems of the World, between three speakers, and extending through four successive days. Simplicio argues for the Aristotelians, 
Salviati for the Copernicans, while Sagredo does his best to be neutral. It will always be a very readable book, and we are fortunate to have a recent translation by Professor Crewe of Evanston. Here we find the first suggestion of the modern method of getting stellar parallaxes, the relative parallax, that is, of two stars in the same field. A method not put into service until Bessel's time, two centuries later. But the most important chapters of the dialogue deal with Galileo's investigations of the laws of motion of bodies in general, which he applied to the problem of the Earth's motion. In this, he really anticipated Newton in the first of his three laws of motion, and in a subsequent work, dealing with the theory of projectiles, he reaches substantially the results of Newton's second law of motion, although he gave no general statement of the principle. Nevertheless, in the epoch where his life was lived and his work done, his telescopic discoveries, combined with his dynamic researches in untrodden fields, resulted in the complete and final overthrow of the ancient system of error and the secure establishment of the Copernican system beyond further question and discussion. Only then could the science of astronomy proceed unhampered to the fullest development by the masterminds of succeeding centuries. Chapter 12 After the Great Masters Following Kepler and Galileo was half a century of great astronomical progress along many lines laid out by the work of the great masters. The telescope seemed only a toy, but its improvement in size and quality showed almost inconceivable possibilities of celestial discoveries. Hevelius of Danzig took up the study of the moon, and his selenographia was finely illustrated by plates, which he not only drew but engraved himself. Lunar names of mountains, plains and craters were owe very largely to him. Also he published, among other works, two on comets, the second of which was published in 1668 and called the Tachometographia, the first detailed account of all the comets observed and recorded to date. Many were the telescopes turned on the planet Saturn and every variety of guess was made as to the actual shape and physical nature of the weird appendages discovered by Galileo. The true solution was finally reached by Huygens, whose mechanical genius had enabled him to grind and polish larger and better lenses than his contemporaries. In 1659 he published the Systema Saturnium, interpreting the ring and the cause of its various configurations and the first discovery of a Saturnian satellite is due to him. Gascoigne in England, about 1640, was the first to make the important application of the micrometer to enhance the accuracy of measurement of small angles in the telescopic field, an invention made and applied independently many years later by Huygens in Holland, and Azout and Picard in France where the instrument was first regularly employed as an accessory in the work of an observatory. Another Englishman, Jeremiah Horrocks, was the first observer of a transit of Venus over the disk of the Sun in 1639. Horrocks was possessed of great ability in calculational astronomy also. This was about the time of the invention of the pendulum clock by Higgins which in conjunction with the later invention of the transit instrument by rumour, brought a revolution in the exacting art of practical astronomy. This was because it enabled the time to be carried along continuously, and the revolution of the earth could be utilised in making precise measurements of the position of the sun, moon and stars. Louis XIV had just founded the new observatory at Paris in 1668, and Picard was the first to establish a regular time observations there. Higgins followed up the motion of the pendulum in theory as well as in practice in his Horologium Oscillatorium 
1673, showing the way to measure the force of gravity, and a study of circular motion showed the fundamental necessity of some force directed toward the center in planetary motions. The doctrine of the sphericity of the Earth being no longer in doubt, the great advance in accuracy of astronomical observation indicated to Willebrod Snell in Holland the best way to measure an arc of meridian by triangulation. Picard repeated the measurements near Paris with even greater accuracy, and his results were of utmost significance to Newton in establishing his law of gravitation. Domenico Cassini, an industrious observer, voluminous writer, and a strong personality, devised telescopes of great size, discovered four Saturnian satellites, and the main division in the ring of Saturn, determined the rotation periods of Mars and Jupiter, and prepared tables of the eclipses of Jupiter's satellites. At his suggestion, Richter undertook an expedition to Cane in latitude 5 degrees north, where it was found that the intensity of gravity was less than at Paris, and his clock therefore lost time, thus indicating that the Earth was not a perfect sphere as had been thought, but a spheroid instead. The planet Mars passed in near opposition, and Richter's observations of it from Cayenne when combined with those of Cassini and others in France, gave a new value of the sun's parallax and distance. Really the first actual measurement worth the name in the history of astronomy. To close this era of signal advance in astronomy, we may start a discovery by rumour of the first order, no less than that of the velocity of transmission of light through space. At the instigation of Picard, rumour in studying the motions of Jupiter's satellites found that the intervals between eclipses grew less and less as Jupiter and the Earth approached each other, and greater and greater than the average as the two planets separated further and further. Rumour correctly attributed this difference to the progressive motion of light, and a rough value of this velocity was calculated though not accepted by astronomers generally for more than a century. Why the laws of Kepler should be true, Kepler himself was unable to say. Nor could anyone else in that day answer these questions. 1. The planets move in orbits that are elliptical, not circular. Why should they move in an imperfect curve rather than the perfect one in which it has always been taught that they moved? Two. Why should our planet vary its velocity at all, and travel now fast, now slow, especially why should the speed so vary that the line of varying length, joining the planet to the sun, always passes over areas proportional to the time of describing them? And three, why should there be any definite relation of the distances of planets from the sun to their times of revolution about him? Why should it be exactly as the cube of one to the square of the other? We must remember that the Copernican system itself was not yet, in the beginning of the 17th century, accepted universally. And the great minds of that period were most concerned in overturning the erroneous theory of Ptolemy. The next step in logical order was to find a basic explanation of the planetary motions, and Descartes and his theory of vortices are worthy of mention, among many unsuccessful attempts in this direction. Descartes was a brilliant French philosopher and mathematician, but his hypothesis of a multitude of whirlpools in the ether, while ingenious in theory, was too vague and indefinite to account for the planetary motions with any approach to the precision with which the laws of Kepler represented them. Another great astronomer, whose labours helped immensely in preparing the way for the signal discoveries that were soon to come, was Huygens. 
a man of versatility as a natural philosopher, mechanician, and astronomical observer. Hagens was born 13 years before the death of Galileo, and to the discovery of the laws of motion by the latter, Hagens added researches on the laws of action of centrifugal forces. Neither of them, however, appeared to see the immediate bearing on the great general problem of celestial motions in its true light, and was reserved for another generation, and an astronomer of another country, to make the one fundamental discovery that should explain the whole by a single, simple law. Chapter 13 Newton and Motion how is it that you are able to make these great discoveries? Was once asked of Sir Isaac Newton, facile princeps of all philosophers, and the discoverer of the great law of universal gravitation. By perpetually thinking about them was Newton's terse and illuminating reply. He had set for himself the definite problem of Kepler's laws. Why is it that they are true? And is there not some single general law that will embody all the circumstances of the planetary motions? Newton was born in 1643, the year after the death of Galileo. He had a thorough training in the mathematics of his day, and addressed himself first to an investigation and definite formulation of the general laws of motion, which he found to be three in number and which he was able to put in very simple terms. The first one is, any body, once it is set in motion, will continue to move forward in a straight line with a uniform velocity forever, provided it is acted upon by no force whatever. In other words, a state of motion is as natural as a state of rest, rest in relation to things everywhere adjacent in which we find all things in general. Here on Earth, where gravity itself pulls all objects downward toward the Earth, and where resistance of the air tends to hold a moving body back and bring it to rest, and where friction from contact with whatever material substance may be in its path is perpetually tending to neutralize all motion. With all three of these forces always at work to stop a moving body, the truth of this first and fundamental law of motion was not apparent on the surface. Till Galileo's time everybody had made the mistake of supposing that some force or other must be acting continually on every moving body to keep it in motion. Ptolemy, Copernicus, Kepler, Leonardo da Vinci all failed to see the truth in this law which Newton developed in the immortal Principia and at the present day it is not always easy to accept it first. Although the progress of mechanical science, by reducing friction and resistance, has produced machines in which motion of large masses may be kept up indefinitely, with the application of only the merest minimum of force. Once the planet is set in motion around the sun, it will go on forever through frictionless, non-resistant space. But there must be a central force, as Hagen saw clearly, to hold it in its orbit. Otherwise it would at any moment take the direction of a tangent to the orbit. Here is where Newton's second law of motion comes in, and he formulated it with great definiteness. When any force acts on a moving body, its deviation from a straight line will be in the direction of the force applied and proportional to that force. In accord with this law, Newton first began to inquire whether the force of attraction here on Earth, which everyone commonly recognizes as gravity, drawing all things down toward the center of the Earth, might not extend upward indefinitely. It is found in operation on the summits of mountain peaks, and the clouds above them, and the rain falling from them are obviously drawn downward by the same force. May it not extend outward into space, even as far as the moon? 
This was an audacious question, but Newton not only asked, but tried to answer it in the year 1665, when he was only 23. On the surface of the earth, this attraction is strong enough to draw a falling body downward through a vertical space of 16 feet in a second of time. What ought it to be at the distance of the moon? The distance of the moon in Newton's time was better known in terms of the earth's size than was the size of the earth itself. The earth's radius was known to be one sixtieth of the moon's distance but the Earth's diameter was thought to be something under 7,000 miles, so that Newton's first calculations were the most disappointing, and he laid them aside for nearly 20 years. Meanwhile, the French astronomers, led by Picard, had measured the Earth anew, and showed it to be nearly 8,000 miles in diameter. As soon as Newton learned of this, he revised his calculations and found that by the laws of the inverse square, the moon, in one second, should fall away from a tangent to its orbit one thirty-six hundredth of sixteen feet. This accorded exactly with his original supposition that the Earth's attraction extended to the moon. So he concluded that the force which makes a stone fall or an apple, as the story goes, is the same force that holds the moon in its orbit, and that this force diminishes in the exact proportion that the square of the distance from the Earth's centre increases. The moon indeed becomes a falling body, only, as Kingdon Clifford puts it, she is going so fast, and is so far off, that she falls quite around to the other side of the Earth instead of hitting it, and so goes on forever. Newton goes on in the Principia to explain the extension of gravitation to the other bodies of the solar system beyond the Earth and Moon. Clearly the same gravitation that holds the Moon in its orbit around the Earth must extend outward from the Sun also, and hold all the planets in the orbits centred around him. Newton demonstrates by calculation based on Kepler's third law that the forces drawing the planets towards the sun are inversely as the squares of their mean distance from him. And if the force be constantly directed towards the sun, the radius vector in an elliptic orbit must pass over equal areas in equal times. Chapter 14 Newton and Gravitation So all of Kepler's laws could be embodied in a single law of gravitation toward a central body, whose force of attraction decreases outward in exact proportion as the square of the distance increases. Only one farther step had to be taken, and this the most complicated of all. He must make all the bodies of the sky conform to his third law of motion. That is, action and reaction are equal, or the mutual actions of any two bodies are always equal and oppositely directed. There must be mutual attractions everywhere, earth for sun as well as sun for earth, moon for sun and sun for moon, earth for Venus and Venus for earth, Jupiter for Saturn and Saturn for Jupiter, and so on. The motions of the planets in the undisturbed ellipses of Kepler must be impossible. As observations of the planets became more accurate, it was found that they really did fail to move in exact accord with Kepler's laws unmodified. Newton was unable, with the imperfect processes of the mathematics of his day, to ascertain whether the deviations then known could be accounted for by his law of gravitation. But he nevertheless formulated the law with entire precision as follows. Every particle of matter in the universe attracts every other particle, with a force exactly proportioned to the product of their masses, and inversely is the square of the distance between their centers. 
The centuries of astronomical research since Newton's day, however, have verified the great law with the utmost exactness. Practically every irregularity of lunar and planetary motion is accounted for. Indeed, the intricacies of the problems involved and the nicety of their solution have led to the invention of new mathematical processes adequate to the difficulties encountered. And about the middle of the last century, when Uranus departed from the path laid out for it by the mathematical astronomers, its orbital deviations were made the basis of an investigation, which soon led to the assignment of the position where a great planet could be found that would account for unexplained irregularities of the motion of Uranus. And the immediate discovery of this planet, Neptune, became the most striking verification of the Newtonian law that the solar system could possibly have afford. The astronomers of still later days investigating the statelier motions of stellar systems find the Newtonian law regnant everywhere among the stars where our most powerful telescopes have as yet reached. So that Newton's law is known as the law of universal gravitation. And its author is everywhere held as the greatest scientist of the ages. Newton's Principia may be regarded as the culminating research of the inductive method, and further outline of its contents is desirable. It is divided into three books following certain introductory sessions. The first book treats of the problems of moving bodies, the solutions being worked out generally and not with special reference to astronomy. The second book deals with the motion of bodies through resistant media as fluids and has very little significance in astronomy. The third book is the all-important one and applies his general principles to the case of the actual solar system, providing a full explanation of the motions of all the bodies of the system known in his day. Anyone who critically reads the Principia of Newton will be forced to conclude that its author was a genius in the highest sense of the word. The elegance and thoroughness of the demonstrations and the completeness of application of the law of gravitation are especially impressive. The universality of his new law was the feature to which he gave particular attention. It was clear to him that the gravitation of a planet, though it acted as if wholly concentrated at the centre, was nevertheless resident in every one of the particles of which the planet is composed. Indeed, as universal law was so formulated as to make every particle attract every other particle, in an investigation known as the Cavendish Experiment, a research of great delicacy of manipulation only proves this. But leads also to a measurement of the Earth's mean density, from which we can calculate approximately how much the Earth actually weighs. Another way to attack the same problem is by measuring the attraction of mountains as Masculine, Astronomy Royal of Scotland, did on Mount Chehalion in Scotland, which was selected because of its sheer isolation. The attraction of the mountain deflected the plumb lines by measurable amounts. The volume of the mountain was carefully ascertained by surveys, and geologists found out what rocks composed it. So the weight of the entire mountain became pretty well known and, combining this with the observed deflection, an independent value of the Earth's weight was found. Still other methods have been applied to this question, and as an average it is found that the materials composing the Earth are about five and a half times as heavy as water, and the total weight of the Earth is something like six sextillions of tons. What is the true shape of the Earth? And does the Earth's turning round on its axis affect the shape? Newton saw the answer to these questions in his law of gravitation. A spherical figure followed as a matter of course from the mutual attraction of all materials composing the Earth, providing it was at rest, or did not turn around on its axis. But rotation bulges it at the equator. 
and draws it in at the poles, by an amount which calculation shows to be in exact agreement with the amount ascertained by the actual measurement of the earth itself. Another curious effect, not at first apparent, was that all bodies carried from high latitudes towards the equator would get lighter and lighter in consequence of the centrifugal force of rotation. This was unexpectedly demonstrated by Richter when the French Academy sent him south to observe Mars in 1672. His clock had been regulated exactly in Paris, and he soon found that it had lost time when set up at Cayenne. The amount of loss was found by observation, and it was exactly equal to the calculated effect that the reduction of gravity by centrifugal action should produce. Also Newton saw that his law of gravitation would afford an explanation of the rise and fall of the tides. The water on the side of the earth towards the moon, being nearer to the moon, would be more strongly attracted toward it, and therefore raised in a tide. And the water on the farther side of the moon, away from the moon, being at a greater distance than the earth itself, the moon would attract the earth more strongly than this mass of water tending therefore to draw the earth away from the water, and so raising at the same time a high tide on the side of the earth away from the moon. As the earth turns around on its axis, therefore, two tidal waves continually follow each other at intervals of about 12 hours. The sun too joins its gravitating force with that of the moon, raising tides nearly half as high as those which the moon produces, because the sun's vaster mass makes up in large part for its much greater distance. At first and third quarters of the moon, the sun acts against the moon, and the difference of their tide-producing forces gives us neap tides, while at new moon and full, sun and moon act together, and produce the maximum effect known as spring tides. Newton passed on to explain, by the action of gravitation also, the precession of the equinoxes, a phenomenon of the sky discovered by Hipparchus, who pretty well ascertained its amount, though no reason for it had ever been assigned. The plane of the Earth's equator extended to the celestial sphere marks out on the celestial equator, and the two opposite points where it intersects the plane of the ecliptic, or the Earth's path around the sun, are called the equinoctial points, or simply the equinoxes. And precession of the equinoxes is the motion of these points westward or backward, about 50 seconds each year, so that a complete revolution around the ecliptic would take place in about 26,000 years. Newton saw clearly how to explain this. It is simply due to the attraction of the sun's gravitation upon the protuberant bulge around the Earth's equator. Acting in conjunction with the Earth's rotation on its axis, the effect being very similar to that often seen in a spinning top or in a gyroscope. The moon moving near the ecliptic produces a precessional effect, as also do the planets to a very slight degree, and the observed value of precession is the same as that calculated from gravitation to a higher degree of precision. Newton died in 1727, too early to have witnessed the complete and triumphant verification of his law, which ultimately has accounted for practically every inequality in the planetary motions caused by the mutual attractions. The problems involved are far beyond the complexity of those which the mathematical astronomer has to deal with, and the mathematicians of France deserve the highest credit for improving the processes of their science, so that obstacles which appeared insuperable were one after another overcome. Newton's method of dealing with these problems was mainly geometric, and the insufficiency of this method was apparent. Only when the French mathematicians began to apply the higher methods of algebra was progress toward the ultimate goal assured. D'Alembert and Clairaut for a time, were foremost in these researches. But their places were soon taken by Lagrange, who wrote the Mécanique à l'Analytique, and Laplace, 
whose Mechanique Celeste is the most celebrated work of all. In large part, these works are the basis of the researches of subsequent mathematical astronomers, who, strictly speaking, cannot as yet be said to have arrived at a complete and rigorous solution of all the problems which the mutual attractions of all the bodies of the solar system have originated. It may well be that even the mathematics of the present day are incompetent to this purpose. When the brilliant genius of Sir William Hamilton invented quaternion analysis and showed the marvellous facility with which it solved the intricate problems of physics, there was the expectation that its application to the higher problems of mathematical astronomy might affect still greater advances. But nothing in that direction has so far eventuated. Some astronomers look for the invention of new functions with numerical tables bearing, perhaps somewhat, the relation to present tables of logarithms, sines, tangents, and so on, that these tables do to the simple multiplication tables of Pythagoras. And I'm going to leave it there. As always, if you want to pick up where we've left off, you can find it on Project Gutenberg at the link in the show notes. Thanks again for joining me on this episode of Sleepy Time Tales, the podcast designed around a bedtime story to help you to get a restful night. New episodes are released every Sunday night to give you something fresh to help you rest in a new week. But make sure to subscribe in whatever service you use so that you get your new episodes whenever they come out. A reminder that the music for tonight is Sweet Night and Friends by Kumiko. Check out more of their work on their website, which you'll find linked in the show notes. Good night, and sweet dreams. <laughs>